Hi everyone, this is Dr. Oliver. Um, we're going to talk about one of the more, I guess, common topics in palliative care and hospice, and that is pain management. So I split this up into three different PowerPoints, that way you guys could listen to them individually, um, you know, when you get a chance. The last one is more um, treatment related, so that one will take a little bit longer for you to go through, uh, but that's kind of the, that one's a fun one as well too, as far as picking what medication and what intervention to do. Uh, so the first one we're gonna start with is pain, and it, just the definition of pain and the different types of pain. So the objective for this recorded lecture is that one, you'll understand the general definition of pain, two, you'll understand the different types of pain, and three, you'll understand how a patient's culture affects their view of pain. So what is pain? I'm sure all of you have experienced pain and you've seen loved ones and patients in pain. Um, all of us handle and deal with stress and pain differently. Uh, so pain is perceived along a spectrum, meaning it can range from peripheral pain receptors to the cerebral cortex and is modified at every step along its travel. We know that pain is complex. Um, not everyone experiences it the same way. Um, it's very emotionally linked, meaning that um, people will associate different types of emotions with pain and with different types of pain. Um, but in general, it's an unpleasant sensory experience. Uh, culture plays into this. So different cultures have higher tolerances. That's found in literature. Um, also in cult different cultures, um, it is either appropriate or inappropriate to show your pain, discuss your pain, or um, al allow your pain to actually show its ugly face to other people. So keep that in mind because some of our more stoic cultures, um, like uh, the Chinese tend to be a little bit harder to, to read because they are a little bit more stoic about their pain. They don't always show their pain on their facial with their facial expression whereas an african-american um, is more likely to tell you that they're hurting and it, you'll be able to see that visually on their face with their expression um, sometimes this makes it difficult to to treat pain and so you really have to kind of meet the patient where they're at the, their pain is what they say it is so at the end of the day what whatever you think of their pain, whatever you would rate their pain, it doesn't matter because it, it matters what the patient feels and is experiencing and what they say. Pain is just, it's a distressing symptom. And so it should be our ultimate goal to not necessarily always completely get, a, get rid of pain because we can't always do that, but our goal should be to get that pain to a tolerable level for the patient ahead a little bit on that last slide but you know we talked a little bit about how culture affects a patient and their family's view of pain so it affects how a patient handles their pain it affects how they feel about their pain and it affects their opinions and choices on pain management um, you know some people have no problem with pain management as far as medications and things like that whereas other cultures um, you know, they are, they're, they're a little leery of medications and they prefer to do more natural routes of pain control like acupuncture, massage, cupping, you know, things like that. So that has to be considered when you are creating a pain management treatment plan for a patient. In the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about the different types of pain. I wanted to just um, put them on a slide here just so that you could see them listed there. Um, the nociceptive pain it contains two subtypes. So there's somatic pain and visceral pain. Um, neuropathic pain is um, sometimes very difficult to treat. Uh, it's kind of in its own little section. Another type of pain that we're not going to talk as much about here just because it is more typically dealt with in mental health, but it's the psychogenic type pain. So it's, these, it's this type of pain that people experience that is more emotionally triggered um, and it's more so typically related to hormonal imbalances. Um, so a lot of the times your psychiatric doctors will, will treat that, um, although palliative care providers can and do need to know how to treat that type of pain. Um, but we will specifically focus on these three types of pain right here. Okay, so let's talk about somatic pain because this one is actually very common and you will see this a lot in palliative care and hospice patients. You'll also see it in patients that perhaps um, do not need palliative care or hospice. Um, it's just a very common type of pain. So in palliative care, we'll, tip, we'll typically see this type of pain with bone metastasis, osteoporosis, degenerative joint disease, 
these are people that will complain of this chronic, nagging, dull, achy, throbbing pain. Um, as you can see there in the little picture I, I included, you know, a lot of the times it originate, originates somewhere in the skin or the bone, um, follows that somatic sensory pathway, and then goes to that sensory cortex um, where our body will um, read that as painful. Um, so, so a lot of the times somatic pain ends up being more chronic pain. And so we'll get to it later, but there's a specific type of treatment for that type of pain. Okay, next we'll talk about visceral pain. And I actually really liked this picture. Um, because it's kind of it, it's kind of nice to see if people are complaining about a certain area, you might be able to pinpoint a little bit better what that may be stemming from. Um, a lot of the times if they're already diagnosed, so say they have ovarian cancer and they're complaining about pain there in the mid middle abdomen there, um, you know, more than likely you can say this is probably more so related to their ovarian cancer that is um, progressing and um, probably spreading out from that original site. So it's uh, one of the most common forms of pain. Um, it's described typically as a squeezing, a cramping, a pressure, um, deep distension or stretching. Um, this can be acute or chronic. Um, I, I would see a lot of this type of pain with liver cirrhosis. Um, so a lot of chronic abdominal, like visceral type pain, uh, my liver cirrhosis patients would complain of this. It's very poorly localized, which kind of sometimes makes it more vague. Um, so you really have to make sure that you're asking them appropriate questions when you're trying to figure out where this pain is stemming from. Um, and, and it's usually felt when internal organs are damaged or they're injured. Um, and, and like I said, this can be with liver metastasis, liver cirrhosis, ascites. Um, it really sometimes can pose a, a hurdle in pain management, but if you know what questions to ask for in your patient and you allow them to answer them, more than likely you can figure out where the pain is stemming from. Neuropathic pain, this is everybody's, um, it's kind of like the evil stepchild of the, of the types of pain because it sometimes is just a bear to treat. Um, I actually, when I got patients that had really bad neuropathic pain. I actually really kind of enjoyed it because I like a challenge. And um, for me, it was very challenging sometimes to treat these patients. Uh, one of my patients that I will never forget, she had neurofibromatosis. And if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's, it's a, horrible, it's a horrible disease. Um, but basically along nerve endings, and, and really it can be different for everybody um, on where they would grow these tumors on their nerve endings. But that's what happens is they grow these um, tumors on different nerves and nerve endings and they they cause a severe amount of neuropathic pain and i will never forget this one lady that i was taking care of in the clinic up in finley and um my goodness we we tried we we tried absolutely everything um one of the only things that really helped her gabapentin did not help her but um we had her on, um, well, so the pain would actually make her really nauseous too. So we had her on Marinol for a little while, which is like a synthetic marijuana that we can prescribe actually, as long as it's in your collaborating agreement. Um, so we tried that for a little bit and that that seemed to help. Um, but then after a while, it kind of it kind of seemed to run its course. And, and that's the thing is neurofibromatosis changes. So you have to really be aggressive with pain management for these people. Um, we tried Lyrica that helped for a little while. But Lyrica, you have to be you have to be really careful about because if you miss a couple of doses, you patients can withdraw really bad. And, and that's exactly what happened to her. She went on vacation and you know, she was having fun and she ended up missing a couple doses and those couple doses were enough to make her withdraw and she just kind of, um, she just went, she went crazy as far as, you know, she just got really anxious and paranoid and, um, you know, once we were able to get that Lyrica out of her system, she was fine and she returned to her normal self, but um, she had a really hard time withdrawing off of that medication. So for her, one of the best things that we found to control her neuropathic pain was actually um, medical marijuana. And at the time when I was treating her, um, marijuana was not approved in Ohio, but Finley is close enough to the border of Michigan that a few of our patients that we, um, that the doctor I was working with that we felt were appropriate for medical marijuana, we would send across the border to Michigan and that is where they would, um, that's where they would get their medications. So 
for her that worked out great. Um, you can also, um, when you're dosing the medical marijuana, you also can compound it so that it will um, it, it, it will help multiple different symptoms. So for her, we were able to treat not just her neuropathic pain, but we treated her um, anxiety and we treated her appetite, which was really good for her. She needed to gain some weight. So long story, I know, but I thought that that was good for you guys to hear. So neuropathic pain is its own disease in, in a way. Um, and, and it can happen, if you look at this picture that I included, it can happen from all of these different things, not just, you know, not just diabetes like we think, uh, you know, we commonly hear that, but there's lots of things actually that can cause neuropathic pain. Some of the medications we prescribe can also cause a chronic neuropathic pain as well. So metformin is one of them with high doses. You have to be kind of careful. Um, it, it, can, it can actually cause later on some chronic neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is very complex. Um, I'm sure you've gathered that by now. Typically it's more chronic um, and it's usually accompanied by tissue injury. So um, the post um, herpetic neuralgia, the diabetic neuropathy, those are real common. A lot of the times people will describe them as burning, shooting, numbness or tingling. Sometimes they'll say it feels like fire um, or something their pain is radiating or electrical. Uh, just not not a pleasant, not not pleasant sensations, but a lot of the times they will will um they will describe it as that these people are also the ones that'll say my pain is 10 out of 10 but because it's chronic and they i mean they have to function in their daily life so because of that because they have um adjusted to it as much as they can a lot of the times these people won't look like they are 10 out of 10 but they are and once you get their pain under control they're going to be a totally different person and and in your mind you'll say oh my goodness i never i never realized that this was the type of person they are now that their pain is controlled um, so so it's amazing they're not the ones that come in there and they're screaming and rocking back and forth because they're in so much pain a lot of the times they're just really stoic and they look depressed and uh, or sometimes they're anxious um, and they they have a hard time focusing and it's because their body literally is exerting so much energy to control this pain. Now, I know you guys probably know this, but I just wanted to kind of go over again. So acute versus chronic, um, you know, so acute pain usually is pretty distinct and it has an obvious pathology. A lot of the times we can pinpoint pretty quickly what it's from. Um, it typically has a shorter duration, so less than three months. Um, so some examples would be a post-surgical pain or a trauma, a headache, um, although, you know, we, as we know, headaches can be chronic as well. So um, they can have kind of an acute on chronic headache um, and we can label it that way in our notes as well. So chronic pain, and this is typically the pain that we deal with, whether it is somatic, visceral, or neuropathic. A lot of our palliative care and hospice patients have chronic pain. So it typically lasts longer than three months, and it's pretty persistent, and it's very complex. Um, so there's lots of different factors that play into how that person is sensing their pain. So again, like I said um, in the last slide, a headache, because that can be more of an acute on chronic issue, um, a slip disc that could maybe be causing some neuropathic type pain. Um, you know, people that, uh, like I was saying earlier, the liver cirrhosis that have that chronic visceral pain, it, you know, it may kind of come and go, um, as far as severity, but it's always present there. So a lot of the times this is when you'll see the physical effects. Um, so, you know, people perhaps aren't getting around as well as they used to. So they have that limited mobility. A lot of the times people, they just, they aren't hungry because they're using so much energy to deal with this pain on a daily basis that they, their body just can't even think about eating. So a lot of the times these people end up losing weight. Um, they really just have a lack of energy. They want to sleep all the time. Uh, so, well, and then, and then they also have very tense muscles. And this is important. I always watch a patient and how they come into, the, into uh, my, my office when I was working the clinic um, because it tells you a lot. You know, if a person comes in and they have their shoulders pulled back and they're making eye contact and they're walking in, they're looking confident, that's a very different patient compared to the one that maybe is being wheeled in on a wheelchair and they have their head down and they're not making con eye contact and their shoulders seem kind of tensed up to their neck. So all of those little things 
that that's really what makes palliative care, I think, unique because in order to appropriately treat our patients, you have to pay attention to those little details um, because a lot of the times those little details, they'll add up and that, that can actually change your whole treatment plan. So just pay attention to those if you guys go into palliative care and hospice. So this is the concept of total pain, and this is a very it's a very big topic in palliative care and hospice. And, and what that means is that um, pain is not just a, we don't just look at pain as a painful sensation. We look at pain holistically. So there's a lot of components that make up what a person experiences as pain. So they can have emotional pain, they can have physical pain, they can have social pain, they can have spiritual pain. So even though their main type of, you know, pain that they're complaining of is maybe more of a visceral type pain. Their emotional, you know, the emotional stress that they have, the physical stress, the social stress, the spiritual stress, all goes in and makes a total, a total pain level so much, so much more higher than, than what it would be if, say, um, you know, they were feeling at peace or say they didn't have a chronic disease or maybe their treatment was going well um, or maybe they, um, you know, had good relationships with their family. Um, maybe they, um, you know, maybe they felt secure in their faith. That person that has those um, securities in place will experience pain in a completely different manner than a person that is just really um, out of sync in those in those four different areas. So it it's so total pain encompasses the multi-dimensional factors that contribute to a patient's personal experience of pain. And like I said, there there's this, the four um, the four main uh, little groupings there. Those are the main ones, and and so it's important when we are interviewing our palliative care and hospice patients about their pain. We're not just asking, okay, what would you rate your pain on a level from one to ten? Ten being the worst pain that you've ever felt in your life. It that the assessment of pain goes so much more deeper than that because. We want to ask about every aspect here listed in that picture uh, because that will give us a better picture of their pain and also how we need to treat them. Um, total pain is very subjective, so we really need to actively listen to what the patient is telling us so that we can treat them appropriately. Um, total pain is also known as suffering, so it's a person's evaluation of the total pain experience and how it relates to their quality of life. So now we're not just looking at pain and what it what it's making their body feel like, but we're looking at okay, they have pain, how is it affecting their life? Are they able to have the life that they want to have? Uh, and if they're not, then we need, to, we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can do to get them to a good point where they can have that life they want. 